Mr. Chair, I think we can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. I just had to un unmute myself. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Carl Pothy with the Attorney General's Office, of course. Um, today I'll be sitting in as the chair for the sub cabinet uh, in Dr. Chowdhury's absence. Um, so, um, uh, having said that, let's just move forward with the agenda items. Um, first of all, I, I see this the, um, uh, the first item on the agenda is the moment of silence for the victims of the Marjorie Stone and Douglas um, school shooting that happened, I guess, four years ago. Um, today's the, the grim anniversary of that awful event. Um, so if we could just observe a moment of silence for those victims, um, and uh, then we'll proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so moving forward, uh, we'll go straight to the agenda. Uh, first of all, well, before we do that, of course, we need to make sure we have a quorum. Um, I mean, Ms. Hessian, does it appear we have a quorum? It, I, um, it looks like we have enough members, but I'm, I can't, I can, frankly, I can't tell because there's only so many people on my video screen. And good morning. Yes, you've got a quorum. You're good to go. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, let's start with the agenda. Uh, first of all, is welcoming new um, uh, staff, um, Ms. Rhodes and Mr. Turner. Um, I don't know if I should turn this over to uh, Ms. Hessian just to, to describe what these, jet, these um, people will be doing, but. Uh... Thank you. Uh, I believe Dino's on the line to introduce our, our new team members. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I want to introduce you to Alice Rhodes, our new communication specialist. Mr. Anthony Turner the fourth, who is Mike Drew, who will be our southern our Lower East Shore Regional Representative. First one will be uh, Drew. I, I can't hear. Well, neither can I. And happy to be here. Thank you. That was Drew Turner. Uh, can you hear me okay? All right. Excellent. Yes. So, so Drew is going to be serving as a school safety and emergency preparedness specialist, and he'll be covering the Lower Eastern Shore region. And then Alice. Hi, my name is Alice Rhodes. I come from the Center for Cancer and the Center for Tobacco at Maryland Department of Health, and I'm really glad to be with MCSS. Carl, you're Carl, muted. I know I got it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get with the program in a moment. Um, the, uh, so it's great, great to have you guys um, back on the team. That's wonderful. Um, I guess we'll move forward now with the proposed um, revisions to the SRO and SSE training. Um, I'm not quite sure who's going to be presenting that. Good morning. How is everybody? Well, I know that you can't see my lips moving, but I'm Mike Radinsky, and uh, I'm a school safety and emergency preparedness specialist with the Center for School Safety. And I also uh, am the person that is the point for the curriculum development and the training of the SROs and school security uh, personnel. A little later on, you're also going to hear from Dr. Krista Kalp, who is one of our subject matter experts, but I'll introduce her as we move ahead. Next slide, please. So as most of you know, we've been training our SROs and SSEs since 2018. As a result of the Safe to Learn Act in 2018, we initially were tasked with developing training uh, we were mandated to develop training for five separate topical areas, all highlighted in red here. Um, as we started to delve into this, and through my experience as an SRO, we knew that this wasn't nearly enough training. For that reason, we developed 23 blocks of training 
uh, which spanned about 37 complete hours uh, for training for the SROs and school security employees in the state of Maryland. And they are all currently listed on your slide. Next slide, please. Every three years, the Maryland Police Training Commission requires that we recertify our program and we reevaluate to see what the needs of the program are. And after last year's legislative session and hearing what the community is looking for in the school resource officers and school security employees, we decided to expand our program from 35 hours to 70 hours, essentially doubling the program. Uh, in order to do that, we expanded several topics and we also added several topics. We took our de-escalation model from a two-hour program to a four-hour program. Our disability and diversity awareness, the title's too long for this slide. It's actually disability and diversity awareness with special attention to cultural fluency. We took that from a one-hour program to a four-hour program. We expanded implicit bias from a two hour program to a four hour program and restorative approaches. This is the big one we took from a two hour program to an eight hour program. And the attempt here is to take the school resource officers and school security employees from a point of topical knowledge on a subject to actual operational ability of that subject. So we're trying to make them more operational in every one of these uh, topic areas. Next slide, please. Uh, you can back up one, I believe, maybe. I think we're uh, restarting the slideshow here. If you would just bear with us for a second. There we go. Nope, back up one. There we go. Thank you so much, Jessica. So in addition to the expanded programs that we had, we created new programs. These are programs that we heard our community and our legislators talk about. And we took the initiative and tried to find a way to create more of a balance in the program to give them what they're looking for in the training. The first uh, module is called Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. That's a program that's set up to train school security employees and school resource officers how to look at the facility and build the facility and provide uh, suggestions to the facility managers on how to better lay things out, keep bushes trimmed, have cameras set up and so on and in order to prevent crime in the first place. Because if we do that, then in fact, we're not gonna have to respond to it later on. The next thing that we're looking at is a three hour crisis intervention module. That is a program that will specifically deal with mental health issues, trauma, and immediate response to young people in crisis in the schools. It'll give the officers more tools within their tool belt that will help them uh, mitigate these situations without uh, moving to the level of arrest. Uh, we're starting a program called Dangers of Devices. We know about the changing world of cell phones, of social media, and we think it's important that our SROs and SSEs keep up on this in order to better respond to the things the schools are seeing concerning these issues. So we've created a two-hour program. We're going to have a data capture program because our folks that we're reaching out to are responsible to report certain information to us, and we want to make sure that they're finding out exactly what information has to come to us right from us. Uh, Safe Schools Maryland is, is a training on our Safe Schools Maryland tip line, and it will be how that operates and what they can expect when they're in schools if, in fact, a tip were to come in concerning their school. Uh, we also have started a program called Understanding Intellectual or Developmental Disabilities. That has a special focus on autism. We know that our SROs and school security employees spend up to eight hours a day or more with the students in the school. That being said, with the inclusion of our individuals that may be experiencing intellectual or developmental disabilities, we know that the SROs and SSEs may spend more time with them than average patrol officers do. 
we've partnered with the Pathways program and, or, I'm sorry, the Pathfinders program and the Pathfinders program specifically trains school resource officers and school security employees on dealing with autism and intellectual developmental disabilities for three hours every three years. We actually are piggyback on, piggybacking onto that and we've had them expand their program uh, to deal specifically with school personnel and the advanced time periods that they'll be spending with these individuals to give them more of a grasp on how to better deal with uh, these students. And finally, uh, normalized adolescent behaviors. Uh, normalized adolescent behaviors is a program that we've had created uh, to uh, teach SROs and SSEs about just that, what adolescents do on a normal basis. Next slide, please. One of the things about our program is we don't develop it all ourselves. I'm a police trainer. I'm a retired school resource officer, and I worked at the Maryland Police Training Commission. But I know that many of these topics can't be trained by police officers to police officers. We're just not knowledgeable in the areas. For that reason, we use subject matter experts. Uh, and our subject matter experts are listed here. Of course, uh, our friends at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center, those safe nurses, they come in and they train our SROs and SSEs and about the victimization of youth in schools. It's very important that, that you understand too, that not only did these individuals work with us in the original development of these programs, they worked with us again on the redevelopment this year of these programs, and they have sent staff members to every one of our trainings to provide the training that they developed to our school resource officers and school security employees. Uh, the Maryland Department of Education, of course, Frederick County Public Schools, Montgomery, Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, the Maryland Educators Association helped us greatly with restorative practices as well as Frederick County did. Uh, the Department of Emergency Management with our um, school emergency planning. I talked to you about Pathfinders. Anne Arundel County Police has assisted us with restorative approaches. The Attorney General's Office, of course, Dawn's here and she's great. She teaches our hate bias, our MOU and our Maryland law class. And last but not least is Anne Arundel County Public Schools. And the reason that I saved them to the end is because with me today is Dr. Krista Kalt. Dr. Krista Kalt is one of our subject matter experts that's been working with us since 2019 on behavioral threat assessments. When we redid our program this year, I reached out specifically to them and her and asked them if they could create a program for normative adolescent behaviors. Well, I don't wanna tell you what they created and, and their, their experiences with us. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Krista Kalt and have her speak. And I'm gonna to have to move off screen. She's gonna to have to come into screen. So your patience, please. Thank you. Good morning, how are you? Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and as Mike said in the introduction, I've been working with the Maryland Center for School Safety, uh, something that has become very near and dear to me as a clinician on the ground working with SROs for the past 16 years, this um, particular subject and all the subjects surrounding the training was very important to me. Um, like he said, I began the training or uh, working with the Maryland Center for School Safety back with the threat determination rollout when Mike approached myself and Dr. Anderson over the summer, we were really excited because we, we thought that this would be extremely beneficial to the SROs. Um, the purpose of the training really was to give the SROs an understanding of the adolescent brain and development. And the hopes behind that was through the understanding of what is normative or normal typical adolescent behavior, perhaps the understanding behind the behavior would sort of increase the safe learning environment and perhaps decrease some of the, um, the, di the disciplinary measures. When we sat down as a PLC with a group of psychologists and we actually included some school social workers who also have worked with school-based police officers and school resource or school safety, um, SSEs, I believe, <laughs> the, the acronyms I have to brush up on. Um, 
And so we sat down as a group and we asked ourselves a few questions. One of the questions we, we asked was, what is normalized or normative adolescent behavior versus criminal behavior? And so what do we see in a school setting um, that sometimes can be misunderstood for criminal behavior, but is really in actuality normal adolescent behavior? Um, some of the questions we also asked is, you know, is this behavior typical for that child's age? Are there disabilities that may factor into their behavior? Is there cultural differences that may be a factor into their behavior? Um, we also wanted to talk about the code of conduct and teaching the SROs and SSEs to work with your teams, work with your school administrators, your mental health, your student support teams, and help them understand the code of conduct, what is appropriate in the school setting. And then in this training, not only do we touch upon the physical, hormonal, emotional, neuroanatomical changes in adolescent behavior, but we also talk about what the SROs and SSEs bring to the table, meaning their own background, their own implicit bias. Um, how can they work with students in understanding that and develop a really safe, protective learning environment? We also touched upon um, incorporating strategies. Mike had touched upon the crisis prevention intervention, restorative circles, peer mediation, working with your teams and working with your mental health providers in the school setting to give these students, um, again, a safe learning environment with understanding their behavior. Not, not giving excuses for behavior, but understanding what is typical developmental behavior. Um, the other thing that we, we felt was necessary in the training in most of the PLC members who worked with SROs and SSEs, we wanted to hit upon how for the SROs to navigate their school buildings and use the resources that are there if perhaps they may not understand behavior. So who to go to in case of a particular um, behavioral outburst, when to go to the nurse, when to go to the school psychologist, when to go to your um, administration or counselor or school social worker, teaching them the roles of those particular um, individuals in the school setting so that when they do have an issue and they don't quite understand the behavior or know how to deal with it, they at least know the avenue to pursue to find out more information. Again, we talk about school demographics, cultural issues that might pertain to a child's behavior in the school setting, um, disability awareness, and we also really put emphasis on debriefing with your school teams and your mental health providers in the school setting after a situation. What worked? What didn't work? What could I have done better? Um, and so it's a little bit of everything. I hope that it is... Um, I think there is some room for growth, but I hope that it's effective. And again, we love working with the Maryland Center for School Safety. Any questions regarding the, the particular training? Okay. okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna pass the, the mic over to Mike. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here are the training statistics for our uh, center. Who we trained each year and how many of each. Um, since I'm on a single screen of Zoom, I have your pictures over the final number tallies, so I'm unable to give them to you currently. Uh, but as you can see, uh, we started out with live trainings. We went when COVID hit to virtual, completely virtual trainings, which is a no-no for police officers. We get a special permission from the Maryland Police Training Commission to do that because as you know, uh, our training doesn't stop. The mandate doesn't stop, they have to be trained. So we went ahead and we converted everything virtual. And then in 2021, we began to create the hybrid training. Now the future of training for us is going to look like a hybrid program with a portion of the training being pre-training videos, which they will then be tested on during the second phase, which will be Zoom. And finally, we will be going out to our trainees to show them that we are real people for a four day live course at the end. I believe that wraps it up for me. Are there any questions for myself or Dr. Cole? All right, well, thank you for your time and attention, and I truly hope that was my last slide.
Thank you so much, Mr. Rudinsky. Um, okay, I guess we're going to move on to, unless there are questions from the from the, the uh, sub cabinet, uh, we'll move on to the next topic, uh, which Mr. Miser, I understand, is going to present relative to student focus groups. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, just one moment while I get uh, my screen shared. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Henry J. Miser. I'm the current student co-facilitator of the Maryland Center for School Safety Student Focus Group. I'm also a junior at St. Mary's Riken High School, which is in St. Mary's County, Maryland, and a resident of Calvert County. I initially became involved in the student focus group uh, from the Maryland Association of Student Councils during their inaugural group in 2020. And since around January of 2021, I've become involved in the regular day-to-day -day operations and a leadership role of the student focus group. So with that, um, some background on our current student focus group. We have 25 students, which range from our youngest in the seventh grade to our oldest in the 12th grade. And these students come from 14 of Maryland's 25 counties in Baltimore City. 95% of the uh, counties in Maryland in Baltimore City have uh, appointed liaisons. Our appointed liaison's job is to bridge a, the gap between the student focus group and our county. So contacting them directly, making them aware of MCSS and the student focus group. And two members from our inaugural focus group have returned to serve as co-facilitators. That is myself and my counterpart who also sits on the MCSS advisory board, Claire Cabral. And our primary job as student facilitators is just to provide guidance and leadership to the group while also serving as a liaison between the group and then MCSS. This is the structure of our current student focus group. This uh, incorporates our biggest change this year, what, which was the introduction of our committees. And I'll talk a little bit more about the groundbreaking work that our committees have been doing. Um, at the top, we have Mr. Meister, who is our MCSS representative to the group. And then, like I said, we have myself and Claire Cabral, who are co-facilitators. Below us, we have our engagement and outreach committee chairs, our legislative committee chair, and our content creation committee chair. The chair's primary job is to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the committee um, and serve as a liaison between the committees and Claire and myself. And then underneath our committee chairs, we have the general members and all of our members serve on at least one of our committees. A little bit more about our committees. So three new committees were established this year, and that was the Engagement and Outreach Committee, the Legislative Committee, and our Content Creation Committee. And we created these committees to try and maximize the time of our students by making dedicated task force dedicated to certain issues. Six members were elected by the student focus group to lead these committees. Like I said, we have the positions of chair and vice chair and 100% of our members serve on a committee which interests them. Um, they demonstrate which committee they'd be interested in at the very beginning of their term. And then Claire and Mr. Meister and myself work together to try and make sure that everyone gets into the committee that they requested. So moving into the initiatives, which our committees have been working on. First, we have our legislative committee. So our legislative committee is kind of in their peak work season right now with the Maryland General Assembly currently in session. So right now they are working on educating the student focus group on legislative matters. So they will be speaking to us at our monthly meetings um, on, which leads me to my next point of the H House bills and Senate bills undergoing internal research. So they're looking into these bills, reading the text, and then coming back to the student focus group and leading discussions about what these bills are um, and their impact on the student community within school safety. And finally, they've been attending additional training sessions. I'm in planning to attend additional training sessions with MCSS Council, Ms. Ludke, about the MGA and just generally how the law impacts um, school safety and students. Next, we have our engagement and outreach committee. So our engagement and outreach committee's purpose is to, again, kind of make that network between the student focus group and our local schools and counties. So far this year, our engagement and outreach committee has been working on establishing contact with the student focus group in local county schools. They've been working primarily this year on establishing a roster of contact information about um, different contacts within local schools and counties so that we aren't having to continuously try and pull and find those informations going forward. 
they've been investigating a way to organize a forum for students, parents, and teachers to speak directly to the focus group. So a lot of times a focus group is asked to provide feedback to MCSS or other organizations. Now the student focus group is really looking to see how we can hear from other stakeholders within school safety. And finally, they've been connecting with our school safety chapters to gain feedback. Um, our school safety chapters are a high school initiative. They operate somewhat like a club. They meet in schools. Um, anyone can establish a school safety chapter at their school. So this committee has also been working to make a network between the student focus group and our school safety chapters to hear what any, if any, feedback they have on the work of the student focus group or school safety in general. We have our content creation committee. So our content creation committee is responsible. It's kind of the marketing department of the student focus group. So, so far this year, um, they've been contributing to the MCSS social media pages. So they've been doing a biweekly focus group Friday post on a variety of school safety topics. They've also been authoring monthly blog posts for the MCSS website. These topics have ranged from things that we as a student focus group are working on to school safety initiatives to just general ways that a new school could get involved with the student focus group or MCSS. And finally, they've been developing graphics and flyers as requested. Um, this, all of our committees have been working really, really hard. Um, like I said, this was a new initiative for us. So they really took a pretty blank framework and ran with it. Um, so I just like to commend all of our committee chairs and committee members for the really amazing work that they've been doing so far this year. A little bit about what we've been working on as a whole group. Um, this slide definitely does not encompass all the work that our members have done. They work tirelessly to make sure that the message of MCSS and the student focus group is spread throughout the state, but it does kind of encompass as a whole what we've been working on as a group. So far this year, we've had the opportunity to present at state and national meetings. We've been asked to speak at the MCSS monthly calls, as well as the National School Safety Alliance, where we operate a kind of question and answer session. We give the attendees a little bit of background on what the MCSS student focus group is, and then provide them with an opportunity um, to ask us questions, whether it be about the student focus group or our perspectives as students. We've also attended school safety trainings and events so at our monthly meetings, we try and have at least one presenter each month. So far this year, we've heard about the role of school resource officers, mental health and mental wellness, uh, suicide prevention. And last month, we had the opportunity to hear from Ms. Ludke about um, you know, the Maryland General Assembly and how it operates and how the Safe to Learn Act governs the Maryland Center for School Safety. And just as a note, the group has definitely taken special interest in mental health and promoting mental wellness. Uh, this idea and message continues to come up in our group discussions. So the group definitely just wanted me to share to the uh, sub cabinet that, you know, this is a very big priority in making sure that Maryland schools promote mental health and mental wellness as much as possible. So shifting gears from what the group has been working on this year to what we are going to be working on next year, some changes and an application and timeline. So we are introducing some changes to our focus group this year. Um, while the structure will remain the same primarily, there will be some changes to the timeline of application. So the biggest change that we are going to be making this year is we are going to be changing our term length from one year to six months. So before a student would serve from July to June, now they will serve a six month term. Um, and we primarily did this because it allows us to increase group activity by bringing in some new and passionate voices more regularly. So instead of having a once a year intake, we will now have two. And this also allows us to make some other really good changes going forward. So one of those changes is current members will no longer need to reapply. So if you're a member, once you apply the very first time, you simply have to renew your term until you are no longer eligible to reapply, which is when you are a senior in high school. It also allows us to accept sixth graders who are halfway through their sixth grade year. In the past, we were hesitant about accepting sixth grade applicants because of that jump from your fifth grade to your sixth grade year. It can be overwhelming for some students because there's the changes of having to go to classes and a new class schedule. Um, but now since we are accepting applicants uh, in December, we will be able to let those sixth graders go halfway through their sixth grade year and see if a commitment to the student focus group is something that they think is manageable based on their experiences of the first six months. 
Um, because we will be allowing members to simply renew their term, we did incorporate some revised group expectations and guidelines. These guidelines will govern whether a student is able to renew their term. So as long as a student has complied with these guidelines, primarily being an active and engaged member and attending at least 75% of our meetings, like I said, they will be able to reapply or renew their term, my apologies. So moving on to our application process, not much has changed here. Um, so our online application opened in December of 2021, and that is due by February 28th. So that deadline is up and coming. Um, the online application includes your name, some background information, demographical information, your school, and then a teacher recommendation. And it also requires a four to 600 word essay or a three to five minute video about one of the prompts on our website. And we are really excited to introduce the concept of a video because we know some applicants may be more comfortable writing and others may be more comfortable speaking. Um, so we did just try to make this application as inclusive as possible so students can demonstrate to us their best selves. After this, select applicants will be invited to have a virtual interview. Um, the primary purpose of this is to just get to know what the applicant is like beyond their paper um, application. And appointments will be offered in May of 2022. So just a visual, um, like I said, December of 2021 is when our application opened. February 28th is when our application will close. Between February and April, we will be reviewing those applications and offering select applicants virtual interviews. In May, we will offer appointments. And then June 1st of 2022, we will induct those new members um, at our very first meeting. All right, so that is all I have. Um, thank you so much for your time and allowing me to present to you today. Um, I am really proud to be a part of the student focus group. It really is a groundbreaking group of students who are very dedicated to MCSS and promoting school safety across the state of Maryland and across the nation. I would also like to take this time um, to say that if any of you or your respective agencies could ever enlist the help of the student focus group, we are always looking for new ways to get engaged. Um, and I'm sure that we would be absolutely happy to help. So I will take any questions you have on the student focus group or our application or changes um, and also any feedback at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miser. That was incredibly well done. And um, it's fascinating. You, you guys are very, very busy and engaged. It's, and that was a really excellent presentation. Uh, do, do any of the board members have any questions for Mr. Miser? I would just uh, repeat what you said. They did an excellent job on that presentation. Uh, one question I have is how many students are in this group? So this year, our student number is 25. That's a pretty okay. big group. Our very first group was about 12 students. We don't have a set number. We would like to keep it relatively probably under 30, I would say, just because when a group gets too big, sometimes it gets too hard to manage. But if one year we had 27 applicants that we thought would be a great fit, we could take 27. And if one year we thought that we had 15 applicants, we could take 15. So it's definitely a fluid number, but we just want to make sure that it's a manageable size. So, and then on that point, um, if you have uh, members that are not participating, will they drop off at the point where they would now automatically be renewed? Um, so a member could drop out if they chose to. Um, another reason that we implemented this six month term is because we were finding that, you know, as the seasons change with sports and such, some students do have a change in commitment, especially our ninth and sixth grade students, because, you know, they're moving into high school, new opportunities for engagement. Um, so the six month term will allow a student to drop out after that six completion of their first six month term, um, but it will like I said, just allow us to make sure that we have the most engaged group of students as possible going forward. And, and do they, if they're not participating, do they, will they still automatically renew? No, they will not. So um, okay. like I said, in those expectation yep. guidelines, um, which I, I share with you guys, if you were to provide me your emails, I could definitely shoot that over. Um, the expectations and guidelines were pretty clear, and the reason we developed those is to make sure that we don't have any members on the student focus group or who are there for lack of a better reference, like a resume builder, if that makes sense. So if you aren't being engaged, if you're sitting on the meetings and you know we're not really participating, that does open the door for an MCSS representative to speak to you and say, um, you know, you really need to kind of get going and get engaged or we will not offer you a reappointment. So a reappointment is not a given. 
Um, and just because you've been on it for two years doesn't mean that in your third year you could um, not given the opportunity to be reappointed. So it's definitely good in the sense that we keep the students who are not otherwise engaged out. Outstanding, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's just that's wonderful. Um, okay, so do any does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Marzi? Okay, there being none. Thank you so much for the presentation. That was that was really yeah. fascinating. Um, okay, so the next thing is the uh, legislative session, uh, an update on what's going on in Annapolis right now. Um, so I'll turn it over to. I'm not exactly sure. Is it uh, is who, who's going to be handling? Dawn, you just went unmuted. So, it's eight so. first and then me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to kick it off. So my, mine's really brief. Um, so just some updates uh, from MCSS perspective. So we, we have our budget hearings coming up. We're in front of the Senate on February 24th, and then on March 9th, we're in front of the House. Um, so we'll participate with um, the Department of Education headquarters briefing, as well as a couple of other independent agencies. Um, of note, on February 3rd, we were asked to participate in a briefing to the Ways and Means Committee on school resource officers and school security employees. Um, so Mr. Radinsky and myself uh, participated in that briefing along with um, some representative, representatives from um, the Association of Boards of Education as well as the local superintendents uh, association. Um, it went very well. Uh, some of the questions were uh, challenging, um, but the meeting itself went very well. Uh, and Mike was able to brief uh, the Ways and Means Committee on the revised and updated training. So, um, but that's it from a, a general legislative update. And then Dawn has a list of bills, which you should have received the document ahead of the meeting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just give you some highlights of some of the things that are percolating through through session. Um, there's a lot more that I keep track of. So if there is anything that you have questions about or you want to reach out to me about, by all means, please do. Um, but these are just a handful of the things that I think are uh, relevant to the school safety world. So the first bill would be House Bill 146. Um, this bill is related to the reportable offense statute and student discipline and makes some alterations to that. Um, that was already heard on February 3rd in the Ways and Means Committee. Um, it does undercut and take away the sort of the meat and bones of the reportable offense statute as currently written. Um, and for some background information, the reportable offense statute was enacted, I want to say 27 years ago now, if my math is correct, I believe it was in 1995. Um, and the purpose of the statute at the time that it was enacted was two prong. One was to provide appropriate educational supports and resources for students who were charged with criminal activity that may have occurred outside the school, right? Because reportable offenses are community-based offenses. Um, and the second piece being having the school have the ability to know that such a thing occurred within the community in order to determine if any adjustments needed to be made within the school environment in order to protect the safe um, operation of the school. So for example, there might have been a victim or a family member of a victim of whatever happened out in the community who attends the same school. Um, or do they ride the same bus, that kind of thing? Are they in the same history class? Um, so that they could make adjustments as necessary to deal with the situation at hand. Um, this would change this so that rather than having the schools have the notification once the student is charged with the crime, they would not receive any such notification until after there's been a disposition by the state's attorney's office. So there's that entire period of time when interventions could be taking place or may need to be taking place for reasons of safety and or additional supports to a student who's been accused of a crime that would not happen if this bill were to um, move forward. Um, the next bill is House Bill 154 cross filed in the Senate as Senate Bill 95. And this is a bill pertaining to um, K-12 public schools with anaphylactic food allergies and develop some guidelines and requirements. 
Um, so it's already been heard in both chambers. It defines a list of the most common food allergens and would require each local board of education to adopt and implement guidelines in accordance with the Maryland School Health Service guidelines that already exist to reduce the risk of exposure to the allergens most likely to cause anaphylaxis. Um, it's a very collaborative bill. It requires a lot of interdisciplinary work um, and it specifically requires that information be provided to parents about 504 plans and the adoption of a 504 plan for a student who has um, anaphylactic allergies. And um, it also contains an anti-bullying component, which technically I think would already fall under the class of disability um, under our existing um, bullying statute, but it doesn't hurt to say it again and it doesn't hurt to say it more clearly, um, but that would protect students who do suffer from severe anaphylactic allergies from um, other harassment or bias um, and bullying within the school's environment. The next bill is House Bill 194, um, and this is a bill that uh, requires that as a part of the health curriculum that students be taught about sexting, not as in how to do it, but as in why it is a problem, um, or the, the, the other implications of engaging in sexting behavior. Um, this was already heard in Ways and Means on January 27th. You can watch the bill hearing. It was voted favorably out of the Education Subcommittee last week. I don't know when Ways and Means will vote on it as a committee as a whole, um, but it, it includes for age appropriate instruction uh, on those risks as a part of that family life and sexting curriculum. So it would amend 7-445 of the education article. Um, and it cross-references the definition in the Courts and Judicial Proceedings article to sexting that was enacted last year during the last, um, during the 2021 session. Um, so I don't, that's a highlight from last year. Um, and the hope is that this bill would be effective on July 1st and that this would be a part of the curriculum starting with the next academic year. The next bill is House Bill 214. Uh, this is also about the reportable offenses statute, but in a different, it's a different flavor uh, related to the same statute. So this one adds a subsection F to the reportable offense statute, statute within the education article, and it provides um, stronger language with respect to information sharing related to a student who's committed to the custody of the Department of Juvenile Services. And um, it advocates for better communication back and forth when a student has to leave their homeschool and, and must go to DJS so that the homeschool knows what's going on and that the student isn't lost in the shuffle. Um, and, it's, and it, and it um, strengthens the, um, it, it's to, designed to present, prevent students from hopping and being passed from school to school without the knowledge of um, background or other needs that may uh, need to be addressed. Um, House Bill 226 is, this bill has been introduced in the past um, and it, in 2021. It's a bill that would require cameras, uh, use of uh, video recording devices, not audio, just video in self-contained special ed classrooms only. Um, so it has some refinements uh, from what the way it was initially introduced in 2021. Um, it was heard on February 3rd. There was a lot of positive testimony for it. There are concerns about whether this is uh, unfairly singling out students um, with disabilities since it only applies to those self-contained special education classrooms. But the way that that was addressed during the bill hearing um, was very much of a, yes, we understand and we don't want to single them out. However, they are exceedingly vulnerable population. Therefore, um, although that would mean they were being treated differently and that the video cameras would be in those classrooms, it was not done for any ill purpose. It was done as a protective means um, for, for dealing with an, a, a very uh, vulnerable population that can't often speak for itself. Um, House Bill 23, uh, this is a bill related to school discipline and data collection uh, related to school resource officers sponsored by Delegate Washington. Um, this bill has 
come up in the past. Um, last year, it passed out of the House and it went over to the Senate and was heard in committee and then didn't move further. Um, there's still it's still under discussion and it hasn't had a vote in the education subcommittee yet. Um, but it, it it deals with some formulas related to disciplinary practices and that piece of it needs some refinement right because there is a formula and ratio related to the IDEA that's in federal regulations and there seems to be some blending or, or confusion about that ratio versus a guideline document that MSDE has related to um, disciplinary practices and, and ratios. So there's that piece that needs some tweaking. Um, and the phrase routine school discipline and not having SROs involved in routine school discipline is confusing for folks. And where we last left off on debate on this particular bill, um, Delegate Washington said he was going to be removing that phrase from, from the bill. So before it gets out of a committee, it will have been amended in some form. It's just still in process. Um, the next piece, is um, House Bill 283, and this deals with the occupant capacity on school buses. Um, so this has been uh, passed out of the Ways and Means Committee as favorable with amendments. Um, and it, it had gotten out of committee last year, it had gotten out of the House last year and crossed over to the Senate and didn't move um, further, but it's a common sense piece of legislation that basically says, you know, if you have to have overcrowding on a school bus due to an emergency situation, we understand and accept that it may need to occur in an emergency situation, but it needs to be corrected as soon as possible, right, and put some guardrails up around emergency situation um, and correcting that within a reasonable period of time, as opposed to what we have heard and what has come up year after year in testimony related to this bill, where there are certain jurisdictions where certain buses are overcrowded and students are riding in the aisle of the bus instead of in a seat, which is incredibly dangerous. Um, so this uh, would go into effect on July 1st and be in play before the start of the next school year if it does in fact um, make it all the way through this year. House Bill 613, sponsored by Delegate Mike Griffith. Um, this would increase the mandatory appro statutory appropriation to the Maryland Center for Safety for the school resource officer adequate coverage uh, grant program that's currently located within 7-1508 of the education article and cross reference to the Safe Schools Fund in 7-1512. Um, and it would increase that funding from 10 million, it, a mandatory appropriation of 10 million to 20 million beginning in fiscal year 2024, but it does not alter the funding formula that is currently also embedded within the statute, which makes it a proportional ratio based on the number of schools, public schools operating within a given school system in a particular year. Um, that will not be heard until March 8th. It was reassigned from Ways and Means to the Appropriations Committee in the House. Um, then the next bill is House Bill 659. Um, this is the Firearm Safety Storage Requirements and Youth Suicide Prevention Bill, otherwise known as Jalen's Law. This has come up uh, in the past. This is um, a newer version of it, um, the, but Jalen Willie's mother, uh, Melissa, has, has advocated for this bill for several years now, ever since the ever since Jalen was killed at Great Mills High School in 2018. Um, so under current law, you can't leave a loaded firearm where a person under 16 is likely to gain access to it, right? But this would amend that so you can't do it for someone under 18. And it also um, prohibits the, the, the leaving of the ammunition where someone can gain access to it too. Um, and it doesn't matter whether the firearm is loaded or unloaded. So if you're leaving an unloaded firearm in a place where a student, uh, you know, a child could gain access to it, that would be a violation of this law. And it has sort of tiered responses as to what the penalties would be. They're all misdemeanors. Um, but uh, if, it, if it's where, if it's, 
found um, storing or leaving a firearm loaded or unloaded in a location where the person knew or reasonably should have known that an unsupervised minor is likely to gain access. It's a 90 days and or a thousand dollar fine. Um, if you store or leave a firearm in a location where the person knew or reasonably should have known that an unsupervised minor is likely to gain access and the minor does gain access, then it's two years and or a $2,500 fine. And the same scenario, but if the minor gains access to the firearm and does in fact um, result in harm to the minor themselves or another, then it's three years and or a fine of $5,000. Um, there's a separate piece of this bill that relates solely to the suicide prevention and, and um, education piece and community outreach piece on that, as well as the, the public health piece of educating the public about how to properly store a firearm. Um, and so that would add provisions to the health general article related to youth suicide prevention and firearm safe storage, um, requires the deputy secretary of public health services to develop a youth suicide prevention and firearm safe storage guide by January 1st of 2023. That explains the change to the law and then it would identify the risks associated with unsafe firearm storage, including suicide, death, serious bodily injury from accidental discharge, et cetera, um, and incorporates the best practices for firearm and ammunition safety storage. It would have to be on MDH's website, make an electronic version available to stakeholders and the public. This bill would go into effect on October 1st of 2022. Um, and requires the deputy secretary to establish a stakeholder advisory committee to make recommendations that go into the development of that guidance document. Um, but again, because that's due, you know, six months after the effective date of this statute, it would require a, conve a quick convening and, and a, and a um, sprint to the finish. Um, and then there would be an annual report required of the deputy secretary on December 31st of 2023. 2024 and 2025 to the governor and general assembly on the implementation of this law and on the distribution of that guide. That bill will be heard on February 23rd. The next one is House Bill 884 cross filed as Senate Bill 119 by Delegate Washington and Senate Senator Washington. Um, all the Washingtons. Uh, so this one has uh, has been voted favorable out of the education subcommittee and this bill deals with the removal of section 26101A of the education article as applied to students um, attending the school. So this is the disturbing school operations segment of the education article, which the, the term disturbing school operations has been subjectively applied. Um, there are legal challenges to this currently, not to this particular statute, but to a similar statute that is within our federal judicial circle circuit within the fourth circuit, um, the Kenny V. Wilson case in South Carolina. So, um, you know, this is a this is a, a positive thing to do in that there may be a judicial ruling that that uh, gets rid of this kind of statute as applied to students in, in the school. Um, so you cannot, you would not be able to charge a student attending a public school where they willfully disturbed or otherwise willfully prevented the orderly conduct of the activities, administration, or classes, um, because that was too subjective and could criminalize, as we heard earlier, normative adolescent behavior. Um, so it would not bar a student though from being charged in another way if in fact their conduct was otherwise criminal. And that was one of the key pieces of questioning that has come up with respect to this is that they wanna make sure that it doesn't let somebody off the hook if they are in fact really disrupting the school environment. For example, making a threat of mass violence, right? But if you make a threat of mass violence, you need not charge under this if you're a student at that school, you just go ahead and charge them under the criminal code um, for a threat of mass violence. So since there were other avenues to do with what would be trimin truly criminal conduct, um, this, this is uh, an easier pill to swallow. Um, Senate Bill 162, uh, Senator Hester 
this would create a um, this this bill was filed in 2021. Um, it requires the collaboration between the Behavioral Health Administration, the Center for School Safety, the Department of Information Technology, and MSDE to produce a cyber safety guide and training course to be implemented in public schools starting with the 2023-24 school year. Um, and the age range that it's targeting is grades three through 12. Um, it's also supposed to be directed towards parents and school employees who interact with students that will cover safe internet, social media, and technology usage. Um, it also is required to address the issues of cyberbullying, suicidality or self-harm, hate speech, sexually graphic contents, illegal substances, identity theft, and cybersecurity threats, the dissemination of false information and negative impacts of social media and technology usage on behavioral and physical health. Um, and this would require an annual update every year to amend and add new practices and new things. Um, and it must be on the department's website and distributed to each county board of education. Um, the next bill is Senate Bill 165. This relates to the jurisdiction of our juvenile courts. It was heard on January 27th, sponsored by Senator Jill Carter. Um, so it removes the exclusion of juvenile court jurisdiction for cases involving children aged 14 and up who committed offenses that if committed by an adult would result in life imprisonment. Um, and, and, and deals differently with the transfer of cases uh, to juvenile court and restricting when they may be transferred as such. Um, this would require amending our training program just because everyone is very accustomed to the juvenile process working a certain way and this would this would um, flesh that out differently. But it also, um, there's a, a different bill that I know was just heard on Thursday, I believe it was, um, that changes where a child would be held pre-trial. So um, that the, the, the court must make the determination rather than the, the prosecutorial authority so that children are not um, housed in uh, adult jail when they need not be if they have not been in fact convicted um, of a crime uh, as an adult. So um, those two kind of go hand in hand and we'll be monitoring that to make sure that we update the SRO curriculum and SSE curriculum appropriately, depending on what happens with those. Uh, the next bill is Senate Bill 214. Um, this was brought at the request of the Department of Human Services and it amends the child abuse and neglect reporting uh, statute and allows it amends section 1-202 of the human service article and allows disclosure to the schools regarding reports of um, child abuse and neglect that uh, where the school system or the non-public school might need to take HR action against an individual working within the school who is in fact the person um, who had engaged in the abuse or neglect. Um, and so this would cover uh, any employees of the public schools, non-public schools, independent contractors who supervise or work directly with students, um, or an employee of an independent contractor, including bus drivers, bus assistants, um, who directly work with that, those schools. And it does have mirrored language that's um, applicable to both uh, schools related to the Archdiocese, the Catholic Diocese of Wilmington, um, and for childcare facilities or home placements for, uh, for those um, children who need to be in home placements. That would be effective on October 1st of 2022. It has already passed out of the Senate and crossed over to the House. Senate Bill 238, and I apologize because I think your bill says 236. That should be an eight, not a six. That is a typo. Um, this relates to crossing guards for our public schools. Um, this was heard on February 3rd. In EHE uh, requires local school boards to hire school crossing guards for every school in the county 
And if the money for it can't come from the school board's budget, then you have to have local law enforcement departments hire and manage the crossing guards and place the funding in the law enforcement budget. Um, this would go into effect on July 1st, 2022. House Bill 797 um, would change the student member of the board provisions for all 24 school boards in the state that would um, authorize having a student member of the board for each of those local boards of education and would give them near fully vote near full voting rights so they would have equal voting rights and they would not vary county to county as they currently do um, the only thing that the student members of the board or SMOBs as they are affectionately called, which I feel, I feel like you guys need a better name. Um, SMO, the, the only thing the SMOBs would not be able to do under this bill is vote on um, HR related actions that are encompassed within 6-202 of the education article. Uh, Senate bill 705. This one is um, related to banning restraint, physical restraint and seclusion. Um, this would eliminate the ability to use seclusion in our public schools, and it would only allow it in the non-public schools in a very narrow window um, and only under supervision um, and only with respect to like professional um, medical advice and um, psychological advice that that was the appropriate thing to be doing. Um, that one will be heard on March the 2nd. And then House Bill 836 um, relates to student athletes. It's known as the Elijah Gorham Act. Elijah Gorham was the football player at Mervo High School who passed away this fall. Um, this bill would mandate annual reports for all public high school sports teams by each local superintendent on or before December 1st of 2023, and then every year thereafter. Um, that would include the number of teams, the athletic teams that each school within the county has, the, which sports are covered by each of those schools, and the certifications held by the coaches for each of the sports teams at those schools, or clearly indicating that they do not have any such certifications. Um, the number of student athletes on each team, uh, the names of the school they attend, whether the team uses the facilities and property of the affiliated high schools or whether they're using like a rec center or something like that. Um, and if they have an independent board that oversees the team or the team's operations, they need to know also whether any of those board members hold any special certifications. Um, and then it has a catch-all phrase that allows MSDE to add in any other things that it wants to know in relation to this topic. Um, and it requires that an AED be located in close proximity to each school-sponsored athletic practice and event. And you must have someone trained in heat acclimatization safety available at all practices and events and develop an emergency policy consistent with the model guidelines for preseason practice heat acclimatization. And I said that word correctly twice, which is a miracle because every time I've tried to say acclimatization before I have, I have botched it. So I'm, it's a good Monday. Um, and then the final one is Senate Bill 706. And this relates to our non-public placement schools. Um, this will be heard in EHE on March 2nd, and this bill would require a salary parity with the public school systems where the non-public school sits. Um, currently, there's a formula available that's applicable to what comes from the state and local government to help fund those schools versus what's kicked in by tuition, et cetera. Um, this would require that the salaries of the teachers in the non-public schools match the salary structure for the local school system where it sits, it would, the, the state and local governments would have to increase their funding proportionally based on the, um, the formula that already exists in that section of the code. But then the uh, non-public schools would have to increase their funding to meet the, the remaining amount. Um, and I think that's it. I'll take any questions that anybody might have.
Okay. Well, thank you, Dawn. That was incredibly comprehensive. Thanks so much. Um, if there are no questions for Dawn, let's move on to the regulations. Um, and I guess, um, Kate, is this you? No, nah, you're stuck with me. Oh, it's still you, Dawn. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all good. So, uh, all right, to the next topic. So the next, the next topic, because we, what we need is more law today, more law. All right. So um, when the Safe to Learn Act passed, we were given multiple pieces within the statute where the sub cabinet could take regulatory action. Right. Um, and and some have been developed and some have not. So we're going to talk through that and where we are and what our existing regs are and then get feedback from you about where we may need to go or want to go. So we have several existing regulations and our section of COMAR is at Title 1440. Uh, That's our, our little area. 14.40 is the Center for School Safety's designated section. You only see two that are up here right now, 0.04 and 0.05, and that's because 0.01, 2, and 3 are what I would call housekeeping type matters, right? They're not, they're not unique or, or uh, of, of substantive nature related to the agency there. They're more standard like open meetings and how to request documents under the PIA and how to change a record with the state agency, that kind of thing. Um, but section 04 and 05 are the two portions that relate to um, certification and training for school security employees and school resource officers. That's 04. And then 05 is the regulation that deals with critical life threatening incidents occurring on school grounds. So the sub cabinet, those were shalls, as in the sub cabinet was required to adopt regulations related to that. And the sub cabinet did. And so for purposes of today, those two we will discuss and talk about um, what might need to be tweaked on those, right? What Now that we've had them and they've been running for a little while, where are we seeing gaps? And I'm going to table that for, um, for just a second. Unless, well, Kate, do you think we should do those first, talk through those first or? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Please. Okay. Okay. So. Right now, with respect to um, the first one, which talks about the certification and training for SROs and SSEs, um, you should have a copy of that with you that has the current regulation. Um, and we, I, I have taken a stab at what I see are gaps or problems or where I think you, know, you may need to have some discussion. Um, I don't know that subsection one or two have, um, well, one, subsection one doesn't have anything. Subsection two, um, B, for our school safety coordinators, this is an area where it may be good to take some, some action to add additional language that helps to give the agency the ability to enforce compliance better. So for example, now it goes through in subsection A, it talks about what the, what the school safety coordinator has to do, um, and then that they would be certified after they've completed certain things. Um, and this has been in effect for a while, and yet, there are still school safety coordinators designated as such who have not completed or complied with all of these provisions. But there isn't a mechanism within the regulation or within the Safe to Learn Act itself for the agency to, um, to deal with that. So um, one of the recommendations I came up with, um, and I'll read this to you just so you can have a discussion about it, is to add a subsection D that says if a school safety coordinator has not completed the trainings required in sections A through C and submitted all required documentation to MCSS within 60 days of appointment to the position by the local school system, 
MCSS shall notify the superintendent of the local school system of the deficiency. And then after that, I've added another section, subsection E, that says failure of a school safety coordinator found deficient under subsection D to take corrective action and come into full compliance within 45 days of the issuance of the deficiency letter will result in the ineligibility of the local school system to apply for safe schools fund grants under section 7-1512 of the education article for the current grant cycle if awards have not yet been made or the next grant cycle if awards have already been issued in that fiscal year. So this, these, the addition of these two segments would allow the Center for School Safety to clearly have um, deadlines by which the deficiencies will go out to those local school systems and a deadline certain by which they must take corrective action or else be ineligible to apply for Safe Schools Fund grants. Um, so this, this would be the time for you all to have a discussion about what you think should or shouldn't happen or other suggestions. I've got my notepad here. I'm ready to take notes. Hey, Dawn. So, so my, uh, my question would be those, those things that they need to meet, those requirements, that outside training or development mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be, is, is there any barriers for them getting that inside of that period of time you're, you're designating? I mean, could somebody come back and say, well, you you put this in play. However, this has not been offered to us um, or, or, or I'm not able to get it for six months to, to, to meet my needs. Is there any right. kind of barrier there to getting the requirements met? Um, so the, uh, the, the training, that's a good point because they do have to have the model SRO, SSE training, right? Um, so they have to have that. That is something that might take some time in order to get, but it, you know, we could add a provision that says completed or registered for, right? Because we know when MCSS is offering them. And even if MCSS doesn't have a class, like if they start on January 1st and our training class doesn't start till March 15th. But if they've started and they've made arrangements to take the class, then we could account for that within the language and tweak that because you're right, you don't want to say you're getting a deficiency letter when there was no way for you possible to, to, to get this done in that time. The other segment, though, of what is required, the National Incident Management System, Incident Command System Independent Study Courses are online. Right. So them whenever. Um, so would you say recommend to add a provision that allows for the registration for that model curriculum training to have that um, at least be registered for it, if not completed? Yeah, but I think that I conceptually, I like where you're heading with it. I, I think that's important not to you know be put in a position where we've artificially created a barrier, so to speak. Um, we just make sure that they can seek what's needed and get it done within the timelines. And if you do that registration versus having completed, there's mm -hmm. gotta be a follow-up mechanism put into the language to make sure within 30 days after completion of the course, we must be notified, you know, however however you think it's appropriate to, 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 uh, to do that. Okay. Yeah, you, you know, the one thing I was gonna suggest, um, and I, I may have missed it in the, in the language you read, Dawn, but, uh, and this goes off of what the Colonel was just mentioning. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, maybe it might be useful to incorporate some language that gives the, um, uh, the center some, regu some amount of discretion when it comes to those particular deadlines. Um, so for instance, if they have, shall do it within 45 days unless, uh, extended for good cause by the center or something like that. I mean, maybe that that's one other way to do it. In other words, there are absolute deadlines, but there there could be circumstances where they may or need will need to be extended, and it will it will give the agency that discretion to do so. Um, it's I, I don't know if that would also open a you know a can of worms. Everybody would do it. It'll, it could be interpreted to mean that the those deadlines really don't matter. You just have to ask for an extension, that kind of thing. So, but maybe maybe something along those lines, um, because that would help sort of alleviate any pressures. Um, you know, again, on, on the topic that was just just raised. Um, yeah. And and again, it just it's it's a way of retaining 
discretion within the agency. So that that's just an observation. Yep. No, thank you for that. And I, I guess the only thing I would say to that is 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 just we got to make it so it's not squishy. And, and it becomes ambiguous to a point where people can start going, well, you know, I was treated this way and this one was treated right. that way. You know, it, it's, you know, I, I get, I get, I get where you're heading with that. You just gotta be real careful not to, uh, you know, allow it. So somebody could say, well, I, I was treated differently than somebody else was treated in right. uh, th those types of scenarios. I think we just yeah. need, need to be mindful of that, that circumstance. Yeah. No, yeah, there, the, I agree. There would need to be some conditions or some objective, non-subjective uh, uh, parameters related to when the agency could do that, as opposed to having it being subjective, um, because that's that's part of the issue now, right? Um, right. So, so um, can. Can I just add as well? So the grants, the school uh, safe schools fund grant, is decided. Those applications come to the sub cabinet, and they're decided there. So would it be to to sort of meet um, the need that I'm hearing? Would it be beneficial if the regulation said that when the application goes before the sub cabinet, the that MCSS will let the sub cabinet know? that the applicant has met all of the, the minimums and if they haven't, sort of what the reasoning is. Um, so then the sub cabinet can make a decision about whether or not they want to approve those grants, that particular application. Would that be helpful? Yes, I think so. You know, I then that's my question to, to Don. I think that the, the sub cabinet has authority to approve the projects, um, but can a regulation be created that trumps the legislations uh, that is funding the, uh, the program? Unless there's something, I mean, do we need the law changed in order to add that kind of uh, language? No? Okay. No, because the statute gives that to the authority of the, the uh, sub-cabinet in terms of the Safe Schools Fund grants. Okay. Then what Kate has said um, certainly ties. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so tying in the comments that you all have made so far, and and knowing that there is a way to for the sub cabinet to take into take into account the compliance at the time of the grant application review, would you still want the agency to have a timeline for when? they send a deficiency letter to the superintendent of the school system to notify the superintendent that someone's out of compliance so that they can take corrective action. Well, um, but my opinion is, and along what Colonel Jones has said, and I think he knows maybe better than any of us, you know, what are the constraints on these uh, individuals in order to comply? Um, so anything outside of that, if they, if they should be able to get it done, with whatever wiggle language um, mm -hmm. is determined, um, I would vote for whatever you recommend. But um, is there a recommendation on the on the table? The time. I actually do have a question. Just, I mean, how how exceptional of a circumstance will it probably be? I mean, does anybody have a sense on that? That people won't be complying. That there will, you know, is it is it going to be a real outlier, or is it? Are we looking at something that would could be more frequent. I, I'm just curious if, if anybody has any awareness of that. So we, we current, as Dawn mentioned, we currently have school safety coordinators who are not compliant. Right. Now, after three years, four right. years. So I would like to say that it's unusual, but yeah. we've also had turnover in some of the positions. So it's possible that the new positions may not be compliant. Um, you know, obviously the last two years have been very unique uh, in that we had COVID. So I would argue to the Colonel's point, that would be an extenuating circumstance that we could all understand um, because we had to transition all of our uh, in-person training to virtual. Um, but now we do have the ability, uh, at least for the existing curriculum to deliver that virtually. Um, you know, the hope is that we will, for the non-law enforcement uh, students, we'll be able to deliver 
a majority, if not all of the, the additional training to the new curriculum that you heard about today uh, virtually as well. Right. And I mean, so, and, you know, despite COVID and despite all those things, those training classes have been going on. Right. But, you know, they, they made, the agency made the switch to that in 2020. Um, and you saw the slide earlier that Mr. Radinsky put up showing you exactly how many people have, have done that, but there are still um, people in that upper level management who are SSEs who haven't done it. So, um, I mean, as to Mr. Garrell's point, what, what are we, uh, where are we with this then? It sounds like, Dawn, you came up with some excellent language to begin with. So now it's go back and, and incorporate some of these thoughts and comments or, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing for you to have to vote on today. This is for you to discuss and for me to make a lot of notes about. So then I can go back and take into account all the different things you've said to make it gel the way you want, bring it back to you, and then you can take a vote on proposed regulations. Okay? Okay. Um, any other comments regarding this section regarding to the school safety coordinator compliance with their training requirements? No? Okay. Um, the next is under the Subsection 03, school resource officers and school security employees certification. Um, I am proposing, and when I, I'm gonna read one and not the other because they are mirrored sections, right? There's one section that's for SROs, one section for SSEs. Um, so just to give you a, a flavor of what this would sound like, um, for example, with subsection A, I've amended it to read as follows, as in a draft, not amended, not actually amended, amended for draft discussion purposes. Um, a school resource officer serving a Maryland public school shall strive to have completed the center's model training program or an approved equivalent local training prior to commencing work as a school resource officer and must complete the training no later than six months after receiving the assignment. So if you're, look, you're looking at the current law, the current reg is what you have before you on yours. So you can see where I added or changed things. And they did that for a couple of reasons. I took out the phrase working in a Maryland public school to account for jurisdictions like Montgomery County Public Schools, which doesn't have School resource, school resource officers who are stationed in a school, but they still serve a school and they still have an MOU. So they're still a school resource officer, even though they go by another name over there. Um, and they still have to take the model training curriculum. So changed that to um, serving a Maryland public school as opposed to working in. The other piece was taking out the reference to 40 hours because as you heard earlier, that's changing. And rather than having to update the regulation anytime there's hours added or other things um, that are done to, to, to that program, um, especially since the 40 hour piece was not a time that was specified in the statute to begin with, I'm removing that and just call it the center's model training program. Um, and then with respect to the timing when we initially did this, it was when we had new, you know, when this was brand new, right? Um, so we have to be flexible in dealing with how people come on board and also knowing the capability of the agency to deliver training and how often that is. And certainly the pace that has been kept even during COVID has demonstrated that there's at least one segment of training um, that is run every six months. So six months is a reasonable time frame to say you have to have completed it because within every six months time frame, there's another training that's been done. Um, the same would apply to the school security employees. So does anybody have any questions related to A and B um, based on the, the comments I just made or things that I'm recommending might you might want to change or any things you want to add above and beyond that. Okay. Um, 
I don't. I, just, just real quick, I, I think it's the same as the last argument, just a capacity versus volume approach of how many people have to get this training and whether the training can sustain that many people inside that six month window. I think we just need to be mindful of that, but it's it's the same principle, but otherwise I'm good. Okay. Anybody else? Um, okay. So subsection C, um, the one that talks about the comparative compliance program, I'm recommending that that just be removed. Because it doesn't, we're, it is not even apples to apples or close anymore. And um, it doesn't seem to be necessary. It was something that was important to stakeholders at the time we were first doing this. It, it, is, it has lost its importance over time. So we have supplemental coverage to, to where that was relevant before. It, it's basically with what's offered now, it makes it irrelevant. That's the yes. That's how that's defined. Okay. Yeah, and the and the timing or the amount of time it listed in there doesn't doesn't match anymore. It's just all different. Um, so okay. Um, so then I'm proposing um, what was section D, which would now become subsection C, be changed to remove what's there now and just have a provision that says each local law enforcement department assigning a school resource officer to serve one or more public schools shall promptly notify MCSS of the assignment. Um, that's typically the way it's been done uh, or has been going. So the local law enforcement departments, when they're assigning new officers, have been letting the center know and saying, hey, we got these new people coming on board, we need them trained. So that, that is, that's, not, that's not being written to fix something that's not working. That is just how it is working in practice already. And that's a good thing. We wanna make sure that stays. Um, and then I would, recommend adding two subsections like little Roman numeral I and little Roman numeral II that say, first, MCSS shall provide documentation to the officer's department regarding completion of the model training program and any other in-service or continuing education for law enforcement officers in conformity with the requirements of the Maryland Police Standards Training Commission, COMAR Title 12, Subtitle 4, and the Public Safety Article of the Maryland Code. Again, the agency's already been doing this. It's there more to inform the public about the process and about the fact that in-service training is required. Um, as as the, you know, all the agency staff have had 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 questions over time and every year as there's more debate about police and schools and so on and so forth. There are still some folks who don't understand that SROs are police officers and that police officers are required to have certain training and that that training must be done in a certain way and that that must conform to the requirements of the Maryland Police Standards Training Commission, right? So there's a lot of different things that are already in play and in practice in the law and the agency's already giving those cert certifications out and making sure that all the trainings approved for law enforcement by MPCTC. So we're just putting it there in plain English so anybody could use that as a cross-reference. Um, the other subsection would be to read any law enforcement officer who fails to pass the examination required by the model training program or fails to complete any required in-service or continuing education required by the local law enforcement department or otherwise required by Maryland law shall not be eligible to serve as a school resource officer in a Maryland public school. Right, so you got to stay current on the things you're supposed to be complying with. As long as you are, you can serve. If you're not compliant, you can't be a school resource officer. Does anybody have comments about that? Okay. Um, question, Don, are you going to provide all of this in underline and strike out to us in some <laughs> <Yes>. time? <laughs> Thank <Yes>. you. <laughs> yes. Um, so the other piece is, and I don't have proposed language for you here yet, 
because I was trying to figure out how to make this happen. So with the law enforcement side, again, as I said, we're not trying to fix something that's broken because it's not broken. They've been doing notice to the agency. The agency's been giving the certifications, all the boxes have been checked and regulations and public safety article being followed. Where we are having a disconnect here is with the local school systems because it's impossible for MCSS to know who meets the definition of a school security employee in each local school system, right? We don't know how many people and which people fit that definition of a school security employee within a given school system. And the problem is if the school system has 150 employees who meet the regulatory definition that we have for that, but they're only sending 25 to training, we don't know, or we have a hard time figuring that out, right? Um, so there has to be a way to ensure compliance where the school system is notifying MCSS of all the people who meet that definition and certifying that those are the people who meet that definition. And then for, um, for that to, to come back to the agency and then for them to do the training and then for the agency to notify um, to notify the school system of deficiencies. So what thoughts do you have on that? Well, one thought I would have, and I was waiting for Colonel Jones to, to say, because he's probably got some better thoughts, uh, Bob Goral here, and that is that, um, you know, you, you can have primary and secondary people, right? You know, where you have primary people that are in these lead roles, maybe 25 of, out of 100, and the other 75 um, are there to assist in some way and may not need to have the full training. Um, but they, they're more or less operating under the guidance in some way. And I don't understand the structures. I wish maybe Superintendent Chaudhary could, could help us with it, but maybe Colonel Jones has a better idea or you. <laughs> that, that's a... Uh... Mm. <clears throat> the problem is if, if you got, if you have one group, then a second group that's in, you know, I, I don't know if lower on the hierarchical scale, so to speak, as is, is, is the others, but if they're doing the same thing in the end, you know, my concerns would be lying in the fact that we have 25 group people that are, you know, that, that have everything they need. And then we have another 75 that have a little bit of what we need. But on game day, that 75 could be doing what the 25 are responsible for doing with, le with less responsibility and, and, and training and, and requirements. Uh, that, 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 that doesn't feel good to me. Um, I, I, you know, I say that maybe not having a complete understanding of what exactly is involved, but you know, just from the outside looking in, <clears throat> I think there's gotta be some common ground found there to make sure we don't have a situation where um, we have folks that are maybe under qualified for a particular role or responsibility in our school systems be put it cast into a position where they're doing something that somebody else should be doing if that makes sense yes so would it be helpful Hearing what you've both said, would it be helpful to for me to come up with something that's sort of like as a kind of what I've done with the other pieces of this, right? Um, and maybe go back and look at the definition of a school security employee that we already have um, and find a way to mm. engage a mechanism for the school system to notify the center of the folks who fit the job who fit the description, the center to send back the here's who's been trained and that it 
rests on the superintendent of each school system every year to certify that all those meeting the definition of a school security employee have been trained prior to the start of the school year because that's what's that's what the law is asking for the law is asking that all school security employees have that training before they are working in a maryland public school Got it. Right? Qu question um so back to the 100 and the 25 that are trained. Um, are all of the 100 full-time, this is their, their only job um, as security officers, or do they, are they double duty? Um, they're security officers, sometimes they're bus drivers another time. Uh, that is unknown. Um, okay. But then the question becomes, if 50% of the time your responsibility is includes breaking up fight and situations where you may be putting your hands on a student, do you only get 50% of the training and knowledge mm -hmm. in order to do that job, right? Is there a way to take this question to them, um, you know, to get more feedback and information on um, the different constraints that we might not be considering um, for something like this, just out of curiosity, just to hear what they say. This, you know, small, I can see some of the smaller um, rural um, areas that do a lot of switching of hats, you know, of jobs just because mm -hmm. they don't have big budgets and, and be good to, to know what their considerations are. Yeah, we can do that, Bob. Okay. If I, if I may, if, if I could offer this up, maybe maybe it's a, such a thing where we take the 25, using that 25, 50, 75, what we're doing, dealing with there, but if we take that 25 and the other 75 and redefine them at, in the sense of a classification, almost have the 25 be at, at that top rung of training and development, then have the others at a different classification that almost reports to the top one yeah you, you know what i mean build build some yeah. sort of structure there redefine it so it's not um th so it's clear that they have a different level of, of um competencies and and skill sets but they are almost like a a direct report of sorts to the person who we know are, are, are the best qualified if that if that makes sense it does, and if I'm taking, I'm, I'm sort of thinking this through now and going, okay, well, if we do what you're saying, mm -hmm. right, um, and we know school system X has trained 25 people, but we know just in passing that there's 75 others who fit the definition of a school security employee, but MCSS didn't train them. If the school system wants to certify that the 25 who were trained do a train the trainer program, do something else for those other employees yeah. and that they are receiving that somehow, but they are not receiving it from MCSS, then they could document that. That's something that could be developed as a part of the agency's form or what have you in terms of making sure, you know, from a housekeeping perspective, the training classes have been offered to everybody who should have them. If a school system's not sending them and they're doing a train the trainer internal model and they're only sending so many to MCSS that we have to have a way to document that and then that falls on the school system to deal with rather than the state does that make sense just establish, establishing different standards for each respective level of responsibility I, I for me that resonates well with my understanding thinking about how they they work maintenance in a lot of their other jobs and it might help uh, to have that training program to keep the important positions, uh, that 25 on top with uh, people that could step into that, you know, mm -hmm. as you as you lose people. Okay. And I think, I, think too, I think, too, you have to have, you know, the, the top 25, they got to have the pride that they're the top 25 and yeah. it gives the, the, the 75 something to strive for if they choose to elevate their game. You know, mm -hmm. I think you got to have that 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 human element piece in it as well. Yep. Thank you. No, this is very helpful. Um, we're going to shift gears because we're running short on time and I don't want to not have a discussion about this last piece. So we're going to take a look at the critical life threatening incident regulation. Okay. Um, 
when this was written, you know, there was a, a an attempt to try to not include everything in the kitchen sink in what would require a report. Um, but what we have found in practice in it being in play is that MCSS receives very little in terms of these reports and not because incidents that are happening don't meet the definition, right? So there's definitely a disconnect and uh, a lack of um, collaboration on this. And because of the way it's structured, the Center for School Safety submits its report to the governor and a general assembly only after having received these other things from the school system. <clears throat> so the school system isn't doing the reports and holding the after action meeting. There's nothing for the agency to then subsequently give to the governor or general assembly. So um, we need to look at this and figure out uh, whether things, for example, like subsection two, the scope that says um, that it applies during school hours, inclusive of after school activities and school sanctioned events on school grounds and while transporting students. And then we have a definition in the next section that talks about school grounds um, and school transportation being like transportation vehicles either owned or operated for the benefit of the school system as being part of school grounds. So there are things like, for example, if a student is shot across the street from the school at dismissal and then ends up back on school property receiving medical aid while all the students are around and what have you and dies on school property, does that meet the definition of on school grounds or not? And should that school have filed an after action report? right, and gone through the process that we have here. Because um, we're having a disconnect about that. What, what drives the disconnect? I mean, what, I mean, just in the reality of it, is it, is it uh, for accountability or is it, um, I, I guess as a system base or is it, just uh, just not willing to do it or wanting to do it? I think it's all of the above, Kate. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, some of it is system dependent. Some of it is incident dependent. Um, you know, the specifics of individual incidents. Um, you know, there are, there are school systems that have had change in personnel. Um, so it's clear that, that some of them may not be aware um, of either the regulation or the law itself. Um, you know, I, we have done, the regional staff have done a really good job of continuing to reach out to the school systems every time we hear about something. Um, as we get notified of a critical life-threatening incident, they've done a really good job of working with the school systems to get an after-action, to have the school system get an after-action meeting scheduled. Um, and inviting us to those meetings because that's a requirement of the law. Uh, you know, I wish I had, Colonel, I wish I had an easy answer to say, I know exactly why we are, we are struggling to get some of this information, um, except to say, I, I, you know, I do think this is new. This is really the first year that we started to, re we had one in 2019 uh, yeah. reported. And we have had uh, just a handful at the start of this year. So it's part of it could just be the learning curve, uh, right? It's a, it's a new requirement, relatively new for them. Um, so it's, you know, we've, we've got some stuff on our end that we have to figure out and internalize um, and figure out the best way to proceed. Um, but, you know, I, I don't have a short answer of why, why they're reluctant to share every incident that's occurring. Well, I mean, from my perspective, when I, when I hear just what you said, Kate, I, it's it's one of those situations, if we got new people, then, you know, the first thing we need to do is make sure they understand what the requirements are. And if we got some new folks or some ambiguity as far as what the requirements are, then, you know, it's hard to build upon 
you know, that those gaps there. So, uh, you know, if it were me um, toying around with this, I would probably have a requirement, maybe whatever's the appropriate time of year to do it where you can get a, a captive audience of everybody involved and say, look, we've had this issue. This is what we're seeing. Just as a reminder, these are the requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and then have an accountability piece built into it <clears throat> somehow um, in the sense of, you know, maybe we go back to what we were talking about as far as grant uh, approvals, you know, I, I don't know what the, what the appropriate um, accountability tool is there, but I, I think before you get, get started, because you're always going to get that one person that says, well, I didn't know we had to do that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, as, as kind of frustrating as that can be sometimes, but, you know, I think it's the education piece that's got to start first, then the messaging, and then the accountability piece. So, and we, and we do uh, just Colonel, just for clarification. So we do send that reminder to the school systems every year. Um, and again, we, you know, we sort of walk them through these, especially if it's their first one. Um, the regional staff does a really good time, a uh, really good job of walking them through what the requirements are, what we're expecting um, back so that we can produce our reports. Um, so I, I would love to have a, a clean answer to this completely, but I, but I don't at this point. Uh, yes, Bob. I have, I have a couple of questions. Um, just to, so that I'm sure on the terms defined, when this, it reads, means an event which conduct occurred, causing yada, yada. Um, so conduct are people doing something, right? And I'm just trying to differentiate it from a physical, like a boiler blowing up or something, right? So it's, it's, it's an about event where one person's done something to somebody else. So that's, that's a good question. That's one of the ones we've, we've talked about internally, right? What is meant by the term conduct? So if there's a boiler explosion and a number of people died, and there was an emergency response and, you know, there was opportunity to gauge the, the efficacy of an emergency action plan, mm -hmm. that's something where that should fall into this. Is the word conduct too limiting? Oh, I, okay. So now I'll ask my second question and maybe we can tie them <laughs> together. Um, the MABE. The American Association of, uh, of uh, a Board of, of Educations, mm -hmm. um, you know, they provide insurance to everybody and there must be a reporting mechanism to them. I know there is like on the boiler blowing up, for instance, because uh, they're liable for all of these things is I wonder if there's a, a reporting system that we can um, cause to be concurrent um, so that it's not an extra step or something that they already doing so MABE does not actually represent all of the boards. some are self-insured ah. and some are pool insured through MABE um okay way 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 back yet when when I was a baby lawyer I I handled tort claims for MABE so I used to you know depend on okay. what county whatever county that had a bus accident a slip and fall in the parking lot whatever it was you know I went out uh -huh. But that's not uniform and that's separate and wholly apart and that's a litigation tool rather than an emergency management and response okay. from tool right um so i wouldn't you know while getting mabe's feedback may be helpful in terms of what would work better for this and mabe was certainly at the table when this provision was written into the safe to learn act to begin right. Right. Um, right. for all of those discussions but um, you know, certainly that's something that, you know, we could get their feedback on in terms of what might be more useful. Um, and if they've heard any expressions of why this is such a struggle for mm -hmm. to, to get mm -hmm. done. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, and, and from, from my lens as counsel to the agency, I want to make sure that, that my client is meeting its obligations and that, you know, even if, if, WBAL and WTOP have broadcast that this incident happened and the school system's not calling the meeting and not doing the report and not doing whatever, should MCSS send a letter still to the governor and general assembly and say, we communicated with X school system on this date about the occurrence at blah, 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 blah. And then um, to date, we haven't received the report in conformity with COMAR 40, 14. Yeah. 
40, you know, what have you, and let it go and just okay. send it up. In addition to the grant funding piece that you've, you know, that y'all have already. Okay. Presented. Well, on the first part of the question, um, you know, a boiler blowing up, I, there's all kinds of things that can happen around the, the physical plant. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a, somebody doesn't lock out, tag out and gets electrocuted. You know, somebody sticks their finger in a belt and chops it off. I could consider all of those serious injuries. And are they something that, that you're wanting to capture? I think the point of this was to capture things which are creating drains on the school system and on the local emergency response system yeah. Yeah. that are occurring within the school mm -hmm. communities so that policymakers can better understand the ecosystem of those things, mm -hmm. how to better direct resources. So that's the landscape of it. You know, I, I think you know, what, what is known inside a school system day in and day out in terms of the number of calls for service and things like that hasn't always made its way to policymakers. Yeah. So this was one mechanism in which you could determine okay. Well, that. all of these things I've described are even slip and falls, you know, are, would require an emergency response. And I, I, I assume when I first read it the first time that it was about you know, a tragic event, like you began, somebody gets shot and they stumble over, but they're, they're big tragic events. So i um, trying to understand. Right. So yeah, I, Bob, I, I do want to say, I want to be very careful that we at the Center for School Safety are not providing a report to the General Assembly or the governor's office on slip and falls. Right. right. So yeah. I, do, I do think there is, there needs to be a threshold Right. Okay. There, there's got to be a level of response. Um, and so, you know, if there is serious injury, if there is death, if there is, you know, if there's a life flight, if there are multiple injuries, you know, I, I think we need to do a better job of articulating what those levels are um, and what part, what piece of the activation of their emergency operation plan right. triggers these events. Right. So if it's a if it's a minor thing and it's and it's, you know, a, this section of their emergency plan, then maybe that doesn't trigger this. Um, right. But I think we need to do a better job of articulating what those triggers are um, to make it clear that this now becomes, you know, it's clear to us. It's clear to them. This is now a critical life threatening incident. Right. Does that well, help? It, yeah. And there is a definition of serious uh, wait, no, serious bodily harm in Maryland law in the statutes, but not serious bodily injury. And so maybe tweaking that and then adding some meat on the bones in terms of like emergency response criteria that like Kate was mentioning that those things and being explicit about that and using the phrase including where it's not limiting, but it's giving examples of, right? In, if you use the phrase including in a statute or in a regulation, it's not meant to be all inclusive, but it gives you highlighted examples of things. So um, would that be something that you all think would be helpful to fleshing that out and changing it from serious bodily injury to serious bodily harm and cross-referencing the definition of serious bodily harm that is already in Maryland? law that, that's that's tough i mean I, I mean it just really comes down to how you define it <clears throat> you know if you can define it successfully I, i'm dealing with this right now uh, with another piece of legislation of how a certain thing is defined and you know you you can do a hundred different people have a hundred different versions of what that means mm -hmm. um and, and the thing is you get into that situation too where if you start going into what we already have we just got to be ready and do it on the front end to go to the legislature and let them understand that we made a change and it's going to affect the outcomes in the sense of you know reporting purposes because sure. man pe people get really when they see big swings in numbers based on redefining certain things it, they, it, it creates it, it creates a ripple so we just need to be mindful of that so i think and 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 you're 100 percent right that unless you caveat a data change or a change that led to a, a capturing of data in a different way, everybody judges it the wrong way, um, as opposed to, and that we see that in the hate crimes reporting, right? Where we have counties that are really good at recording 
reporting the hate bias and hate crimes incidents, well, people think there's more occurring there. And we're like, actually, no, per, per capita, it's not. They're just very good at dealing with it and they're proactive as opposed to ignoring, right? Um, so we always have to explain it and caveat that. Well, you've given me plenty to work on. Um, you've given me lots of things to touch upon before we wrap up, because because we're about to be at that point where where my colleague will then ask for a motion to adjourn. Um, there are some shall regulations that um, one of the shall regulations is about mental health services coordinators and helping them get their jobs done. Um, we have not touched that. We have talked to the mental health services coordinators. We've probed what it is that they want or need. Um, so in, if you all think it would be helpful for us to come back with a suggested regulation on that, we can. Um, it's just something that the sub cabinet has not had time to address yet. So um, that's something I'm happy to put together. I just need your blessing to do so. We have a motion to bless. No, let's do. Yeah, no. Let, I, I, it, it seems like it should. The, the ball should be advanced on that. So that would be great. Okay. Frankly. Thanks, Don. Mm -hmm. All right. The other ones um, relate to grant funding, and it sounds like from this conversation. Um, based on the things we've already talked about that perhaps having a regulation related to grant funding would be helpful that ties back and relates to the other pieces, particularly if in a cross-referencing kind of way, if you're going to tie compliance to grant funding eligibility, um, is that something that you would like me to take a stab at? Well, it sounds like you already are I mean, tied previously yeah. to our, our other discussions. Great. Yeah, I, I don't want to be a work creator, but I think it's a great mm -hmm. suggestion, frankly. I think it's, you know, again, it's advancing the ball in this and it's bringing it all together too, so. Right. I know, not like I don't have other things to do, but no, I, I you know, I get it. Um, and, you know, this is, a, this is a good time to do housekeeping and feel like we're getting things done. So that you know, it takes a while, the regulatory process takes a while. So uh, mm -hmm. we wanna make sure that we have ample time to review, discuss, consider, revise, et cetera. So, okay. Yeah, and then try to get it back out to who do you think it's gonna matter to hear their concerns before we go too far because that, that does take a long time, the Comar process, you don't wanna kick back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Well, that is all I have on regulations for today. So, okay. Um, thank you, Dawn. Um, so, th I think that's the uh, end of the agenda, of course. So, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. And uh, there's, you know, if that motion is, is motion. granted. Motion. Second. Second. Motion granted. And we'll see everybody on May 9th. And thank all you right. so much. Thank you. you guys take care. Yep. Bye bye.